tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 2. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four terrifying tales for you about inhuman visitors, vanishing vehicles, sleepless specters, and manifest imaginations. So lock your doors, turn the lights down, and settle in. This show's about to begin. Our first story this evening is by author Sasha Brokov, entitled Stairs. His eyes opened to the sound of his Alice's bedroom door, squealing open. Sleep tugged at him, but his parental sense demanded that he get her back into bed. He heard her bare feet slap on the naked floorboards, As he rolled out of the warm envelopment of his blankets, he clumsily put on his slippers and stumbled out into the living room. At the apartment, she had always slept fine, even when she had been a baby. It was only since the move to this house that she started to act strangely in the night, getting up, wandering the house, talking to her friend. The kid seemed a bit old to invent an imaginary friend, But it was an improvement. The first few nights in the house, Alice had woken the whole neighborhood screaming. From the kitchen wafted the sound of soft weeping. He followed and was greeted by an unexpected sight. His tiny daughter, dressed in her nightgown, standing in front of the open basement door. She just stood there, looking down into the basement, quietly sobbing. He thought it strange she had not put on the light, and even stranger that she would stand in front of the scariest place in the house, alone in the dark. He approached her, put his hand on her shoulder, and gently suggested, Let's go back to bed, honey. Without looking or acknowledging him, she slowly lifted her arm and pointed down into the basement. Had she thought she had heard something? Was that why she was up? He let his eyes follow her finger into the blackness. Softly, comfortingly, he said, There's nothing down there, honey. Let's go back to bed. Without even looking at him, she just continued to sob and point. Something felt wrong, but he had to put a stop to this behavior. She needed to feel safe in her new home and to put away all these childish fears. Explanations hadn't worked. Now he had to show her. He stepped down onto the first creaking wooden step, leaned forward and flipped the light switch. 
The illumination shocked his eyes but fortified his resolve as he heavily strode down to the very bottom of the stairs. With confidence in his voice, he looked about and proclaimed, Nothing down here, honey. I don't know what you heard, but... Suddenly and abruptly the light went out. Terror struck. He looked back up the stairs. There his daughter stood in silhouette, no longer pointing but standing motionless. Eyes wide, he watched the door as though swung by a powerful unseen hand, swing shut, leaving him in the most utter of darkness. He bounded up the stairs once, twice, stopped, and reached forward for the knob and escaped. He reached, but his hand found nothing. He swung wildly at the wall for the switch, but found only bare, smooth wall. Gingerly, he stepped forward and continued to reach. Surely the door must be close enough to feel by now. Slowly, he took another step, his hand blindly groping into the nothingness ahead, and his feet constantly misjudging the next step. One more step. Two more. Three. Four. He climbed, and his speed and panic increased. It had already been at least several floors' worth of stairs. How is this possible? Maybe he should try to go back down. It would be easier. Remembering that the basement stairs ran under his own bedroom, he cried for his wife. Vanessa! His voice seemed unusually loud, as if in a confined space, and echoed back towards him from below. Essa, Essa, Essa. The echo pushed him beyond attempting to rationalize this insanity, and settled any contemplation about going down. No, going down into inky, echoing nothingness seemed like a very bad idea. Better to go up into inky, silent nothingness. Cautiously, sightlessly, he resumed his climb, feeling ahead into nothing with his outstretched hands. So many stairs and his legs ached. He turned and sat on the step. Alone, he felt a solitude more complete than he had ever known. Darkness, desperation, and despondency mixed in his soul as tears began to flow. What was that? He sat bolt upright and held his breath. Was that a sound? He strained his ears but only perceived the pounding of his own veins. Then distantly, slightly, maybe, like a scrape or a whisper or just a shifting of air, sound seemed to echo up from below. Adrenaline poured into his veins and overrode his fatigue. He rose and heedlessly dashed up the stairs. Several times he tripped and battered himself on the steps, but still he rose and charged on it. Yes, he was sure now, at first barely audible but rising steadily, a roaring, whirling white noise. It seemed to be all around him, engulfing him, drowning out all other sound and sense. Blindly, his senses overwhelmed, he frantically sprinted up until, oh! falling, impact, pain, rolling, hurting, breaking. It was late the next morning when Vanessa finally awoke. She wrapped herself in her terry cloth bathrobe and made her way toward the kitchen. As she passed Alice's room, her maternal instinct led her to open the door, crack, and check in. Her mind was not awake enough to realize the incongruity of the child's room, dark with all the shades drawn in the closet door, in front of which Alice sat, wide open. Morning, honey. No response. What are you doing? Do you know where Daddy is? With an uncharacteristically serious expression, Alice slowly turned her head and responded in her tiny voice, Talking to my friend. Vanessa withdrew to the kitchen to make her coffee. It took an hour or so for her to finally open the door and find his battered and beaten body at the bottom of the basement stairs. Later, the coroner would speculate that he had run flat into the closed door at the top of the stairs, had fallen back and broke his neck, and several other bones as he tumbled down. The only really odd thing was that he was so bruised and battered from such a short fall down so few stairs.
Our second story this evening is by author Adam Davies, entitled, I Carved a Fairy Door. My wife is screaming and sobbing. She is cradling filthy, stained baby blankets in her arms. Nothing makes any sense. This started three months earlier. My four-year-old Amy loves fairies. My wife and I have always tried really hard to avoid any gender stereotyping with her. She loves watching Power Rangers with me on TV. We have plastic toy dragons and dinosaurs that we play with together. Still, she loves fairies. We live in Yorkshire, with its perennially cold and rainy climate, but we're outdoor types and spend as much time as we can in our garden or exploring the boggy, steam-filled forests around our village. We have a few logs that we use as seating around our pond, and when my wife became pregnant with our second, I thought it would be nice to carve a fairy door into one of the logs, something special just for Amy, so she didn't feel too left out when the new baby came along and dominated proceedings as only newborns can. It took me a few months, Work doesn't allow me much spare time, less again when I'm also getting the house ready for the latest arrival, but at last, about six weeks ago, it was complete. Carved and painted, I was very proud of myself, even though it's fairly amateurish. Amy was thrilled. She would play endless fairy games out in the garden while my wife and I prepped the house. One day, about two weeks ago, before due date, she said to me, Daddy, a fairy came through the fairy door today. Oh, that's nice, hon. I said, looking up from my phone partway through a text message. He says he wants to talk to you, Daddy. Uh, Daddy's a bit busy to talk to fairies just now, sweetheart. I'll play fairies with you on the weekend, I promise. Okay, she sulked. I didn't, and within days our daughter was born. We called her Josephine, and Amy loved her little sister with all her heart. Exhausted but happy, our little family was complete. Two weeks after Josephine was born, Amy spoke to me again at bath time. Tommy Shoggle still wants to talk to you, Daddy. I looked up from my phone. Who on earth is Tommy Shoggles? The fairy who came through the fairy door. That's a funny name for a fairy. I thought fairies were called things like Tinkerbell and Sparkle Shine. Don't be silly, Daddy. I like him. He said he wants to talk to you before it's too late. He said we have the balance all wrong. I was already back on my phone, completing my Amazon order. Tell Bobby what's his name. Daddy will talk to him on the weekend when he has a bit more time. I had so much to do and didn't have time for fairy games. The next morning, when I went into the bathroom, there was a terrible smell. I just missed standing in a turd, taking pride of place on the floor. I went to see Amy. It wasn't me, it was Tommy Shoggles. She was in floods of tears. It's okay, honey, everyone has little accidents. You will never get into trouble for having an accident. I reassured her, cleaning up the stinking mess. It wasn't an accident, it was Tommy Shoggles. He said he did it to make you listen. He said our kind have stopped listening. I turned to face her. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I know Daddy's very busy with work, and Mummy is busy with your little sister. But we both love you more than the whole world. Why don't we play fairies now before I go to work? We did, and she was happy. The next morning I could smell the same stench as the day before, but much stronger. I was cross. An accident was one thing, but I didn't want Amy getting into bad habits and blaming imaginary friends. I was not ready for the scene when I opened the bathroom door. Excrement was smeared all over the walls. Gagging from the stench, I didn't see the writing scrawled in human feces on the walls at first. Humankind has broken the pact. There must never be more life takers than the life giver. I ran to check on Amy. I had to protect her from whoever had broken into our house to do this. She was playing calmly in her room. Sweeping her into my arms, I held her tight. Are you okay, sweetheart? 
and frantically checked her for bruises or cuts. Tommy Shoggle said you'd be cross. I asked you to speak to him, Daddy, and now he's mad. He said mean things. My heart was racing. I was angry and scared. Has Tommy hurt you? I dreaded the answer. No, Daddy, he's my friend, and he wouldn't hurt me. Tell me about him, Amy. Tell me what he looks like. I don't know what I was hoping. That Tommy Shoggles was some friend from school. That this was all some nightmarish attention-seeking from our little girl, upset that there was a new baby occupying her mummy and daddy. He's a grown-up, but he's only little. Her hand gestured to a little under her waist. He has braces that holds up his trousers, and his teeth are big and wonky. He looks like a giant from a book, but small and quite hairy. How does Daddy speak to him, honey? Can I come with you to the ferry door now and I can meet him? No, Daddy. He said that you have to leave an envelope with his name on next to the ferry door. You have to knock three times and say his name each time and leave the envelope and go back into the house until the morning. I stood in the rain, envelope in hand, and knocked. I would have felt ridiculous if I wasn't so angry and afraid. Tommy Shoggles, Tommy Shoggles, Tommy Shoggles. I bought some security cameras on my way home from work. That night, after I set them up to record inside and outside the house, my wife and I made plans to take Amy to see a child psychologist. I barely slept and in the morning went straight out to the damn ferry door. The envelope was dry despite the constant rain that had fallen all night. I pulled out the letter inside. It was written in a tiny, meticulous script on some sort of parchment or maybe even skin. It read, You humans make two things from your foul debauchery. Your gluttony produces your dirt, and your lust makes your squalling babies. Your dirt is precious. When you spread it on the ground, it makes all things grow. It's the life giver. Your young are the life takers. They grow and breed, killing and consuming. Their appetites voracious and infinite. Plant, beast, stone, nothing is sacred or safe from them. Centuries ago, the two courts came together and made a pact with man. We made you understand and you agreed to the great balance. You promised you would give more life to the planet than you would take away. You agreed a tithe of young that we took as changelings to seal the agreement. You've broken the pact. Your science makes you live longer, appetites ravaged, unchecked. You tear up the sacred places and foul them with your monstrous structures and evil plastics and metals. Where once you shared your dirt with the earth, now you process it, add vile poisons and chemicals, and make it spread death, not life. No more. Both courts are again united. From this day forth, we will no longer suffer no more of your young. We will take them all, leaving your dirt in their stead, until you understand your place again. We made your kind to feed the earth, not to force us to unmake you. My wife's screams broke me from my disbelieving trance. I ran back into the house, upstairs to her screams. The gagging stench of human filth hit me before I heard her weeping. My baby! Where's my baby? She is screaming, cradling filthy, stained baby blankets in her arms. Josephine is gone. Nothing makes any sense. Thanks for joining me tonight for Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you like what you heard and would like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's episode, which includes two more terrifying tales, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, where you can sign up for a season pass and get access to all 24 ad-free extended episodes from this season or sign up as a patron for just $5 per month 
and get access to not just my show, but our network's audio archive of hundreds of previous releases, including premium versions of our other shows, such as the Simply Scary Podcast and Horror Hill. Not only that, but you'll be lending your support to this very program and help me continue bringing nightmares to life each and every week. Thank you very much for your support. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like to perform? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review on a daily basis. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs on YouTube and my name. And you'll find if you're listening don't on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights bell YouTube channel, icon to get do us my a favor and hit the subscribe button. Got a and scary bell tale of your own that you'd like to perform? CTFDN I take as well. submissions to get more Email it to me today me at through Otis and another at episode of this program. Each com. and every have your terrifying tone. Don't consider hit for production up in a future episode of this show. That's O T I S. And don't forget scary to podcast. Dot com. If you've enjoyed you what you heard on tonight's program a and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, you'll get subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your, your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales today, for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.